Is there anything else to share there? Because I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, I've got um, the. I was given a book in the footsteps of the Russian snowman by Dmitry Bayanov, and that wow. has a great deal of this. And Dr. Bertseff gave that to me, and uh, since then I've contact with Dmitry. So I, Dmitry actually sent me this. Uh, which I believe is from that book. Uh, it looks like it's page 175, paragraph three. And it was in response, to actually, what I had about, uh, um, I basically had asked about Christianity forbidding interaction with the Leshy and what was going on with that, because Dr. Bertseff had said that, and this is what Dimitri had sent me. Um, so it is in that book. There is quite a bit, too, I believe, Jean-Mary Kaufman, if you go to the Relic Hominid Inquiry website and look up some of her writings, are excellent. And she spoke quite, quite, quite a bit to the local uh, people about the Almasty, and you'll get some stories there also. Um, there's a lot all throughout Europe. There's even some in Persia. I have a, it looks like this one excerpt was from Persia, and... The Naznas, Nazda or whatever, is uh, in the 12th century, which is very curious about man. And if it uh, sees a lonely man, it abducts him and is said to be able to conceive by him. Uh, this was uh, Nizami, D.B. Nizami. And one such success story in crossbreeding is reported by the Kazakh folklore telling of this. And so... Uh, you know, when we look at the Zana story, obviously this wasn't isolated if that uh, these sorts of things were happening. And in Zana's situation, it was a female um, uh, Almasti um, and, and who was, uh, I believe, when Igor, this is interesting, you'll probably get uh, from the, what Igor told me. When she was abducted, I believe she was quite a bit younger than what we would uh, expect. I don't know if she was fully an adult yet or a very young adult female, but she was trying on uh, pants or some undergarments of some sort. She was trying to put some clothes on when they when they caught her. <laughs> and this, this is something Igor had told me. Uh, that's on my website. You can read that. I do have a lot of cool stuff on my site, I guess. I don't. I forget about it because I read it and post it. And I guess if, if I don't share it with other people to come read it, then they'll never know. But a lot of this stuff Igor has given me or Dimitri, and it's really cool. But this background information is something I had never known. So um, he said, yeah, that... Uh, That's kind of creepy that that keeps coming up over and over again in their legendary about the female Bigfoot swiping human males. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the other thing is about regions where these things are, you know, like uh, uh, Pakistan. You wouldn't think of Bigfoot being there. Well, it's mountainous, it's next to the Himalayas, and they got the Captar there. But, yeah. you know, you, you just referenced Iran, which obviously is going to be difficult to get any kind of research out of Iran. But um, now that Iraq has opened up, <laughs> there's Bigfoot there, too. I had somebody three, four years ago now that was uh, on Facebook with me uh, who was from northern Iraq and uh, was telling me that their home village is being pestered by a Bigfoot. He had been around the village for like three or four days. It was scaring the hell out of the locals to the point where a local news crew came out, did a story on it, and actually filmed it. And got pictures of the tracks, and he sent me one of the pictures of one of the tracks. So here's Bigfoot harassing a village in Kurdistan. Yeah, yeah, and this is a global phenomenon of what we're what we're finding. If I could uh, get in just briefly, talk about the DNA connection. Yeah, let's do the that. DNA thing. Um, yeah. When when we talk about Zana, that is the show we had done before, and um, one of the things with her is what connected me to Dr. Birdseff is that he had actually dug up. Her, uh, the son of Zana, her skull, or his skull, uh, quit skull. And when Zana was, uh, this would have been in the late 1800s, when she was um, abducted and she was passed around, eventually it was, you know, just almost a, a, a form of trafficking. She was uh, wound up with a, uh, a nobleman. And um, by then she had was fully adult, I believe. But I think she was when she was first captured, she was she was very young um, as far as um, I don't think when she was a full adult, she was six foot six and she could carry uh, 120 or 170 pounds with one hand and carried up a, a, 
a hill to take flour to the ground to get ground and she could swim the Makva River uh, and it's high tide and very furious uh, uh, and go out and just swim like a fish and she could she run could as fast out on a horse yeah out run a horse. So humans she, can't do that yeah and and on a hot day uh, she would go and lay beside the water buffalo in the mud and so I don't know anybody that would pull that off either. Uh, so there's a hole in the ground and sleeps in there when they've got the option of being in a house. Absolutely. She, she would, that's, that's what she would, how she would sleep too. And so, uh, she was very, um, she had the reddish hair was very, uh, large, powerful build. Um, and the, these, uh, teeth that can crack a walnut, you know, and, and oh. just the description of her, was not of uh, of what um, when the research was done. This was all passed on through word of mouth. But when she first started having these children, she would take them to the river and try to wash them in the river. And of course, they would die because not they couldn't survive a hybrid human uh, to this. The hominid. river is too cold. Too cold, and they would die. So they would be like stillborn at that point. They would just die. And so what happened is the local women started. Uh, before she would take these kids to the river to clean them up after having them, they would just take the baby. And so uh, there were subsequently, uh, I think, four of, uh, children that she had. And I think I, I sent you some pictures of these, um, of their descendants. Um, so Quit was one of them, and he was the eldest son. And he died, I believe, in the 50s. Uh, was so Kvit an actual uh, a kid of hers or a descendant one of her kids? He was actually her child. Yeah, okay, that's what yeah, I thought. He was he was her child. Of course, they were raised by the peasants in the in the town there. Um, and uh, just to be did, clear with everybody, so they're wondering like where these kids are coming from. She didn't have a husband. She was being like passed around. What them. what was explained to me by Dr. Birdseff was, and I have this, and again, this is all right. If you go to my sauna and the Black Plague, I have all this on this on my website. But what would what they would do is this nobleman uh, would have his friends over and they would get drunk and they would get her drunk and she would um, then uh, be a, uh, uh, amicable to sexual interaction with these uh, gentlemen, if you want to call them that. And again, it's just a, a, a really a sad kind of trafficking type mm -hmm. situation. And well, it isn't like anything that isn't happening right now. It probably absolutely it's it's, it's a sad story like that, and uh, and these sorts of things uh, go on. But this this was very. You know, I suppose it was back these guys. It was a test of man, you know, manliness and all that. To have yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Business. I guess so. Uh, and I imagine you'd have to have a few shots of vodka to pull that off. But at any rate, a good deal of these children, they believe, was this nobly, uh, the nobleman, the, the guy who owned her, were his children. They believe Quit was one of his sons. But uh, so these children survived. They lived on. And um, one of the an anomalies of Quit is that he was very strong. Uh, he could he could hold a uh, table in his teeth and lift up a big wooden table, which I'm sure they're solid wood in this region of uh, Abistan. I can't remember the name of the area, but it's one of these Russian provinces near the Caucasus region, uh, Georgia is what yeah, it's it is. It's in. or something. Yeah, it's in Georgia. So uh, of the Russian uh, near the Caucasus Mountains. But at any rate, one of the things he could do, he could carry it, you know, pick up a table with his mouth, with his teeth. Oh. So uh, very strong. He lost a hand in, in a fight that was cut off because he said that he was very quick tempered, uh, which uh, I imagine he wouldn't have lost many <laughs> fights. But uh, they do. Uh, what happened was, is they were able to uh, corroborate these stories from people who lived during that time period. They were still alive when they were, uh, they were very old, but they remember these children and they remember this uh, Zana and all that from the late 1800s. And um, when she died, she was buried in the family, um, this this nobly's uh, family cemetery, as well as Quit and her other uh, children. They uh, one of the graves that were found was very old and archaic, and they thought it was Zana. And Dr. Bertsev has uh, has got those bones, so we do hope to get. We may even have Zana's original um, bones, and they are. 
um, able to, uh, some of the things we were trying to do is to get these things tested. And right now we do have people that are able to test them and are willing. There is private money coming up. People are doing these sorts of things. So hopefully, you know, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag for him because this is his research, but I, I'm hoping to hear some good things from him in the future. Um, but yeah, Interesting timing on that. It seemed like shortly after we did that show and I sent him a copy of it all of a sudden that he wanted to do the DNA research. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of interest in it. And what we've seen now, uh, see, Dr. Bertseff did find quit skull, and he did, he did dig that up in the uh, in the late, uh, in the early 70s. He was able to find that, and I sent you a picture of that with him. And that really has kind of put this in the catalyst then, because uh, there's been some DNA research done on that. And uh, one of the studies done was by Dr. Sykes of... Uh, of Oxford, and he came up with a couple of theories from it. One of them is that she was, uh, Zana would have been 100% um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and in that way he was comparing her to being possibly a slave, that she was a slave that had been left uh, to, to roam the wild, apparently. The other theory, which didn't get a whole lot of interest, uh, because at that time, Dr. Birdseff and uh, and um, Dmitry Bayanov and uh, Poznov, all of the earlier hominid researchers believed that that this was a um, Neanderthal, um, that they would have been a Neanderthal descendants. Right. And that just wasn't the case. What, what, what Dr. Sykes had found is that the percentage of Neanderthal would be no more. I have Neanderthal in my DNA. Uh, would, would be no more than what the average person would have. So that would have been... Um, that they would not be Neanderthal is what he was saying. So uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa um, connection, he did say the other uh, theory that he came up with is that there would be an archaic hominid that would come out of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and populate this region, and that it would be of unknown uh, to us at this time. And that's a possibility. He left that open. Well, uh, consequently, a few years after that, in 2017, a study came out of the, from uh, doing studies of just mucus uh, membranes that we have that break down sure. bacteria. They were able to find uh, there's a archaic common or archaic introgression only in sub-Saharan Africans, and that was the research that I had connected to Zana. Uh, and kind of got me started down this whole road uh, recently. So that was a big deal. I gave us a talk about it, and you and I discussed that. And I really, uh, truly believe that that this is the the origins of the first these first hominids that came out of Africa, and then they populated all over the world. And that they're the current hybrid uh, of the, for instance, like if we're talking the Yahweh, you'd have the aboriginals who had hybrided with this, this Y chromosome hominid out of sub-Saharan Africa has created the Yahweh. And then if you look in the, uh, like into the Iran, it could be some Denisovian and uh, Neanderthal. You're going to have a variety of these kind of what I call emergent hominid theory. So anybody can read my theory on my website is once they emerged out of Africa, the sub-Saharan region, they um, uh, once Homo sapiens, they went and populated the world, and then Homo sapiens came later and started interbreeding um, with these populations as they went as we traveled. And so there was a lot of early interbreeding. We've seen that with Denisovian, with Neanderthal, and now we know there's a third. Uh, Introgression in Africa that they previously didn't believe was happening. Uh, fast forward here in April of this year, uh, and they even mentioned the MUC7 uh, gene, which I thought I've really kind of tipped my hat to that in this study. It was a pan African study, and they have not done a lot of research in Africa for DNA. So they, it was out of Spain that they did this Pan-African study, and they found more evidence of introgression, and they've actually found a connection of where these introgressions would have taken place again in Sub-Saharan Africa, only in these populations. It's a very interesting study. You can, it's linked on my website. And that's just, again, a confirmation of this research that we're seeing, again, a third independent study outside of anything not looking for Bigfoot, 
but they are basically corroborating all of this research that we have an introgression from a from an archaic hominid, and uh, that's really exciting because they also found that there was some interbreeding with Neanderthal as it came out and came back. So we know now this emergent hominid theory, at least I do, I believe, is being validated through. The studies that are completely independent. We didn't have any money to, to do a DNA study on our own. These are scientists uh, that are looking into the genome of the Homo sapien, and they're finding this uh, introgression, this archaic introgression. So, uh, in the Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's it's very exciting to see this continue. The other thing, Duke, that's going to be fascinating, and a lot of this that they're using is artificial intelligence and deep. Um, they're doing some deep programming through this AI, through DNA. And I truly believe that's going to solve this. It isn't even going to be, uh, the validation will be maybe getting a hair in the future. But I think this genome will be figured out through this deep, uh, this deep AI uh, scanning of, our, uh, of the human genome that we will actually find the origins of this. And I think I already pointed it out through that Sub-Saharan African Immersion Hamid theory. But anyway, exciting stuff. Uh, it all kind of connects to Zana, and Zana um, is really that, uh, I guess, the, um, the, the sad, tragic story of her life as is going to uh, probably give us the fruition of an understanding of this hominid population, this global phenomenon of, of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Wood, Wood Moose, the Aran, the Awe. Um, uh, so it's exciting. It's exciting times. Yeah, I'm super psyched. I mean, that they're launching a DNA study is cool in, in and of itself, but that they might actually have the skull of Zana to do the research. Yeah, yeah. And that was absolutely fascinating because they weren't for sure, but it is very different. It was pretty archaic looking. And it was and in, it's the, in same the right region. place. And the it was skeleton's the same... about the right age. Yep. Yeah. And I, I sent you a picture of the picture of Dr. Birdseff in the grave with her, uh, what we believe to be her. So um, I don't want to totally let the cat out of the bag because I know this is his research, but I, I think I can at least share that much, uh, that, that there is some exciting things to hopefully be happening soon that, um, that we'll be hearing some news from that because he has spent his entire life um, working on this. And I just feel honored to be able to play any role at all. In fact, to call him a friend and to be able to yeah. uh, communicate with him has just been exciting. So I was very fortunate to tie together some of the research that I think has helped uh, shine a light on this. But you also got to consider we're living in times where these uh, computers, this artificial intelligence is doing uh, – uh, a, a whole lot of research in the genome that's going to uncover things, uh, and it, it's all—it's literally like the equivalent of paleontologists finding a fossil bed of the mammoth or something, and and they just keep finding more and more information. So this—it's going to be mining of the genome through this AI that's going to uncover things, and it, it might not necessarily mean finding the body, although I do believe we have possibly a, a body already. We have Zana, so um, yeah. it's it's exciting. It's exciting to see how this, it's almost going to be reverse engineering how this is all going to come about, I guess. But um, there, there is a part of the cross uh, interbreeding and things that are going on that uh, people were very, there's still a group of the scientists that, that aren't buying that yet. They think that's more of an anomaly that this this interbreeding uh, that it did not occur, as, as, uh, and that it is um, that these are their own distinct species. But I do believe that what we're, we'll see is a hybrid. And we know if you study genetics, you know over time, the, especially the mitochondrial over time passed on through the male genetics. Uh, kind of uh, the male line, the Y chromosome carries on much farther and is the stronger, uh, is hereditarily carried on from father to son. So if we have males doing that, uh, that's gonna be passed on that way. And the female, if it's a, if a homo sapien over time, that'll be less and less of that DNA uh, will be there over so many years, uh, over generations. So um, interesting. Back out again. So in other words, the interesting point there, they could, hybridized with humans several times and breed it completely back out of their gene pool again. If they're pretty much like down to very small, 
yeah. down to like a, as as little as I have Neanderthal in mind, right. which would have been that long ago. So yeah. they can intermittently, uh, you know, kidnap human females and inbreed them and get hybrids for a while, but eventually it's going to breed back out of the gene pool and they're going to be back to being squashed. Through the male, yeah, the male dominant line will eventually still rise rise to the top there, yeah. So I think that's why you'll see a difference in their in sighting. Some of them are more stronger ape-like features and others have more human-looking ones. Well, you know, that might have something to do with that. How far along were they or what, was there an intergression in modern times? Or is this well, one straight isolated? Kind of my pet theory, if you go over and look at the Pacific Northwest where there seems to have been more uh, inbreeding going on, uh, you know, there's rumors that there's several tribes there where it wasn't like completely str- uh, frowned upon to have a Bigfoot for a mate. Um, and other places of the country that was like definitely taboo and they'd almost go to war with a Bigfoot uh, if they tried to kidnap any of the humans or anything like that. Um, and in it seems like a lot of the Bigfoot from over there they look more like a native. They've got, you know, like the long straight hawk nose and that sort of thing. They don't have the big flat squished down uh, boxer or Australian looking nose or anything like that. They look more like a Native American. And so it could be that there's just more hybridization going on in that area. But it's almost leading me to wonder, because if you look at the parts of the country where there probably wasn't any, at least the tribes are really hostile to the idea. Actually, there's a lot of type twos, and type twos don't look that much like humans. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe the type twos were the original population, and what we're thinking of is the type ones um, are actually like hybridized to a certain extent. I think that makes sense. It it does to me anyway. When you when we start looking at the genome and the genetics, I I do believe I'm totally uh, believe they do. Their origin was Sub-Saharan Africa, and and I I, I believe the science will catch up with that. Uh, at least that's what it is. Still continues to support that theory, and so I think we can safely say there is. Uh, I think I sent you uh, a uh, some tree of the of some of the early uh, of the primates out of Africa, but we can't be for sure it's any of those. This could just be a completely different ghost uh, uh, species uh, of Hamid. So, um, but it's interesting that, that, that they're left their, their genetic sign, their signature, and that we can today still, uh, um, that signature will be important as we move forward to, to find out uh, more about them and to, to, to develop hominology as a science uh, all of this stuff is going to play a, a huge role in this this evolving uh, research that we're all doing so it's exciting and I'm just happy to play a small role in it and just kind of excited to be able to share this information yeah this is the kind of this is the stuff that really makes my ears perk up I get all kinds of fascinated with this kind of information here so uh yeah, super cool, man. I know some people are probably just sitting there like nodding out and putting their head on the table right now. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get back to the Bigfoot Horror Stories next show. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's plenty more of that to be shared. And, of course, I do have stuff like that that's happened to me. But ultimately, just like you, Duke, I, I just – I got to figure stuff out. You know, I got to find out what – what is this? What What is the origin of this? How did this come to be? And yeah. that's kind of what dr- that drives me. And so for other people, they're perfectly okay with uh, you know, not knowing. But uh, the fact is science needs an answer and we need to be working, having people working towards it this way. And all these other stories are great. I love listening to them too. But, you know, this is the reality. There is a story there. Uh, Zana did happen. That is a true story. There's physical evidence of it. There is interbreeding that's occurred. We are dealing with a species that has duality in it. That has this 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 science side. Another, the another science point on the line for the inbreeding thing is don't forget about the uh, Ketchum DNA study. Yeah, exactly. So there's just a it's a it's a there's a mosaic of a picture forming there. And, uh, you know, there is, it is based in, there is some scientific basis for it that I, I think a lot of times uh, people get um, uh, overlooked that, 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 you know, these stories are always fun to hear and all that, but the reality is we still need to prove their existence and, and this is very important work, so. 
Well, I'm not going to prove their existence. Somebody else can do that. I'm just going to gather information on how they do things. <laughs> yeah. That's not my, you go. You can go prove their existence. I already know they're real. I'm just interested in how they do things. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, there's there's so much to learn. Uh, we're just scratching the surface, but I think that theory that I threw out about emergent Hamid theory, if anybody wants to read that on my website, uh, I think it is a, a fairly relevant in what we're looking at when you look at the there, you know, just a few short years ago, we didn't realize the Denisovian and Neanderthal were interbreeding, and and all of this interbreeding that was going on, and and now it's very much a, a fact that this was happening, and it didn't take much. It was only a f small finger, really, of some of the fossils found. So uh, it doesn't take much to, to change a paradigm shift and all of this sort of thing. And, and that's exactly what they want to do with hominology is to create this sort of scientific paradigm shift and get this, this research to, to be acknowledged in the scientific community. But, you know, I'm and this, still- This is a, such a baby science. It's in the really, really beginning stages. I mean, it's like not even a toddler. It's still got diapers on. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, I mean, and, look at when, and, when we were kids, they were still trying to tell us that Neanderthals were our ancestors and we evolved from them. And, you know, yeah. look at how incredibly wrong that was. Yes, absolutely. So they're just, you know, just getting your, just getting wrapped around this. But, you know, you look far, far enough back and Lioness was very correct in his, when he created the binomial nomenclature, his his assertions of these being, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, either homo nocturnus, so that they were nocturnal, or they, and they had uh, um, cave dweller, the troglodyte, you know, all of these things are very yeah. pertinent today in our research, but yet science of the time, uh, only a few uh, short years later, were basically saying he was wrong. And the reality is today, I'm saying he was exactly right. He knew what he was doing then, and we just need to accept it. Yeah, and don't forget Homo ferris, get Homo nocturnus, Homo ferris. Yep, yep, Homo ferris, so all of that. Uh, and Homo wood, wet, wood, wood woesensis, and that's, I'm making that one up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the British one. Yeah, yeah, so it's, and and this is a global phenomena, so that's that's exciting to me, and uh, to, I, I've just felt blessed to be able um, to have gotten connected to people. I've uh, I recently had been put on. I think there's going to be some things coming out that's going to help connect more people and a, a database of people all around the world, uh, wherever you're at. That they'll be able to tell where the researchers are in this term field of hominology and research and yeah, I think, that'd be uh, handy oh my i think God, deborah yeah deborah hatswell of, of uh in, in britain had reached out to me and others to be on that so i will be on that and uh, that that map and so i think we can uh, as soon as the they can create more people for the database certainly want to get you on and everybody else who's interested so that's good you know, there's actually a handful of researchers up here in the Montana, Idaho area. And I mean that literally, that's like a handful. That's it. Yeah, and, and but that handful needs to know they're there. And if somebody comes in and has an experience, then that'll be great to, to be able to reach out to you guys. So, yeah. Uh, and that's, I think, what happens is that people have experiences, but they really don't know where to reach out to and, and don't know anybody in that area. And who wants to breach that subject at the you know coffee table? So uh, you typically it just disappears. And I think that's what we see like here in Nebraska. A lot of the farmers, they're not going to go downtown in their cafe in their little small town and start talking about this because if they get ostracized there, they're they have nowhere else to go. So uh, they're certainly if not they even have a computer, they're not looking online at the latest big. Yeah, product. they're not looking, and and they they just don't have an outlet, but they have experiences. So it's underreported. I think severely underreported in the interactions that people have had, and it's just us trying to get the word out. But uh, there's certainly way more things going on out there than what um, than what. It's under the radar than what what, what most people would be uh, able to count or be aware of. So, well, I know that's the fact because when I got here to Montana, everybody was going like, "Oh, there's no Bigfoot in Montana, are there?" I mean, like seriously, they, they, there hadn't been enough reports that they had ever heard from Montana, so they thought there there was no Bigfoot here. Yeah, 
they yeah, magically know, never right? cross over from Washington and Oregon that are just yeah, this that mountain up. range. And yeah. I know when I first started getting a uh, goat, when I came there and I first hiked up in the mountains, I started seeing these structures. And I'm like, yeah, they're here. They're absolutely here. And, uh, you know, that was just exciting. It still is exciting to me wherever I go, if you see those sort of things. And that but, goes to your point, though. It's like you have to have a witness in order to make a sighting. So like exactly. a place could be like literally crawling with Bigfoot, but if there's no humans walking around there to see one, you'd never know it. Absolutely. And you've got some, some of the densest uh, mountainous forests there are in the, in the continental USA. So uh, not hardly anybody is in them. So there's yeah. no 50, 53 them. mountain ranges. And, you know, that's only a third of the state, the forested mountain range part. There's two thirds of it that doesn't have that. We got a million people spread over that entire state. So there's way less than a million people in those 52, 53 mountain ranges and millions of acres of forest. So, yeah, you know, I mean, like Bigfoot can easily avoid ever being seen here. And the fact that there's been like 240 sightings that I know of in Montana and with that few people, Montana may be the most squatchiest place on the continent. If you go per capita, how many people there are in the state and how many sightings the state has, I think we probably kick everybody else's ass, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. From what I've experienced while I was there, uh, I I would give you my um, support in that just by the sheer size of the of the habitat you have. Um, it's I know you were having fun. You were here for what five six days. Yeah, and yeah. every day you were trying to get out there, and you were going to a different area, different mountains, sometimes yeah. even a different mountain range and everywhere you went you were finding huge structures getting there yeah well. i found them everywhere all the way from kootenai river area there and, and the rattlesnake and the blue mountain and uh, patty canyon lolo national forest everywhere i went they're there and they're right yep. around town right around missoula oh god i know <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go a million miles out in the middle of nowhere to find them they're right above where the houses are in patty canyon as soon as yep. you get above where the properties are boop, they're there they'll find you at that point yeah we were just walking around there yesterday i think i was telling you this before we started recording i had a a, a friend who's a fan of the show lives in la gets out here like maybe once a year once every two years but when he does he stops by and i took him squatching and uh, we went to Blue Mountain, and then we went up to Patty Canyon. When we were up in Patty Canyon, we're walking around. And one of the things we find laying by the side of the trail is the uh, the lower half of the foreleg of an elk snapped off. Whoa. There's no hunting in this area, and there's no camping, and there's no predators in this area. And so what's... Yeah, I've and I've seen deer legs laying around, uh, you know, pulled off, and they do that. They'll grab them by the leg, and uh, and they'll pull them. They can just dis dismember anything very easily and just gnaw away at it. Yep. Yeah, Kevin saw Glag do that. I don't know if you caught that part of the interview where he was talking about he wanted to make Glag a really big knife and shop so Glag would have something to skin deer with and stuff and then he showed up with it and uh glag had a deer there and, uh he grabbed one of the legs and twisted it off like a drumstick off a cooked chicken that we would do it he kind of realized uh he doesn't really need a knife this was stupid why did i even think he needed one yeah yeah he's got this <laughs> and that's with the hide on not cooked fresh yeah. dead deer yeah yeah <laughs> God. So, yeah, if Bigfoot wants to pull your arm off and beat you over the head with it, he definitely can do it. Don't don't piss off the Wookiee. That's my advice. Absolutely. You are so right. We're very fortunate that there's not more people hurt for as many people to go out there. So, uh, but, but do be safe and, and use the buddy system and, um, and, and be smart. When it's time to leave, it's time to leave. And, uh, you know, use your gut feeling and these sorts of things. And, um, you know, just if that. Yeah. If that cloud of dread descends on you, leave. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Don't be stupid. Take chances and just stay there or anything like, you know, some idiot would do like maybe me or something. Just definitely leave. And don't go out squatching by yourself solo. That's dangerous as crap. Only complete idiots like, you know, me or something would do that. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> I don't even do that anymore because it's too dangerous. And, you know, like. Absolutely. And I probably definitely shouldn't do that 
unarmed and alone. <laughs> So yeah. I won't do that anymore. You have my word. I won't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> but I just wanted to sucker the Bigfoot into thinking, you know, there was like totally no way I could hurt him. I'm there by myself. I don't even have a weapon. You know, there's, you guys don't have to worry about me at all. You can come right up and steal food out of my tent. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sure got him close enough. I had plenty of tracks around the tent all the time. It was really unnerving, but... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that because if you're in an area where there's not a troop that have like a good personality and a decent help or running it, you could be like really dead. So that's not a good plan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, uh, and the, usually the young ones kind of keep an eye on things, but you know how it is with young uh, people, you know, adolescents, they don't have the best judgment. So I wouldn't be trusting them too well. <laughs> no, and that's part of the problem. You know, they get to make the first contact with you and decide what they want to do, and then they get back to the alpha and let him know, hey, there's a human over here camp for some reason, blah, 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 and he makes a decision. Yeah. I was up there in Patty Canyon. I was there for about a week before the alpha showed up to check out camp, and he made sure that I knew he was there. He stepped on, like, the only soft part of ground that was anywhere around there and left a nice 21-inch track for me to find. <laughs> And, oh yeah, Dad, like, stop by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was like so freaking obvious. It was the only soft spot of ground he could have stepped on and left the track. So uh, you know, if if you find one there, he left it there on freaking purpose. You know? Absolutely, that's his calling uh, card. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I went, oh, okay. Well, let, let me think now. Um, appeasement, appeasement. Oh, give him a couple of pork chops. That'll make him happy. <laughs> There you go. So that's when I wrapped up a couple pork chops in tin foil, and I left them on the little stump right outside of the the thicket that I was camped in. And uh, I can't say for sure it was him because I couldn't see in the dark, even though he was about forty feet away through the thicket. But you sure as hell could smell him, and you could hear him moving around. He sounded really big, and he smelled friggin' horrible. He smelled like a rotting meat locker. Uh, but you could hear him unwrapping the tin foil, and then a couple of munching, chewing sounds, and then you could hear him walking away again. And I went out there and looked the next day, and there was the, the tinfoil. I had wrapped it three times around the the two pieces of uh, pork chop that I gave to him. And uh, whatever took him apart didn't have claws or anything. It carefully unwrapped it all three times and just yeah. dropped the tinfoil on the ground right there. No evidence of the pork chops. That was all gone. Well, that was suffice to your uh, fee for staying in his woods. So. Yeah, I mean, apparently it worked because after that, they didn't come right around the thicket and the tent anymore. They left that area alone. And before that, they were there like almost too much. and It was getting kind of mm -hmm. creepy. But yeah, that's all you needed. Apparently, give him a little bribe, make the alpha happy. Oh, good pork chops. OK, leave him alone. He's OK. Yeah. <laughs> he knows we're here and he bribed me with a pork chop. That's fine. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> I'm glad I did that, actually, because they kept trying to get into that that little S-shaped uh, tunnel into the thicket where I had my tent. And I'd actually set up two IR monitors on there with cross paths. So if they tried to sneak past one, the other one would catch them and it would make noise and I'd hear it. And the rest of the thicket, they just literally couldn't get through. A human couldn't have crawled through it and not made a sound. So. Um, but yeah, there was a couple of times where something kept trying to come into that little entrance and those little sensors would go off and alert me. And I'd start getting up, and as soon as I started moving in the tent, whatever it was took off again, you know, trying to get the hell out of there before I got out of the tent. Classic. Creepy stuff. Well, I suppose we should better wrap it up here, brother. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Folks, don't forget, go check out his website, noxgigas.com. Totally kick-ass, great repository of information, and he updates regularly. So go, 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 go check it out. That's right. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, had a great time again talking to you and you know it's uh it's always uh a privilege to come on world bigfoot radio well thanks brother all right well thanks for coming on the show and we will be having you on again for more and future updates um for the purposes of anybody that wants to help support the show please go to paypal.me forward slash world bigfoot central and you can donate there the show is entirely viewer supported and relies on your generous donations to continue to bring you these quality programs which you've uh, come to like too much and actually want to binge watch now so anyway <laughs> uh thanks all you guys i love you 
thanks so much for all the outpouring of kindness that I've been getting from uh, folks that found out that I've been injured in a, a bike crash recently. And uh, to all of you that are showing up, if uh, this actually comes out before the, the weekend in question, looking forward to seeing all you guys here and going squatching. And once again, thanks to all the listeners out there. Don't forget to like and uh, thumbs up that thing, subscribe, share to your friends, and come back for the next episode. I love you guys. Take care. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.